also with us for an artist talk in brown bag. Uh, Susan received her BA in painting from the University of Northern Car Colorado and an MFA in painting from the Savannah College of Art and Design. Um, she's currently an associate professor at Eastern Oregon University in the art department. Uh, her work has been shown widely in the US from Portland, Oregon to New York. And she's the recent um, 2022 Arts Commission Individual Artist Fellow recipient. So congratulations, that's exciting. Yeah. And uh, also she recently judged our show, uh, Nature in the Abstract. So you might recognize her name and some of her work from there. And I think I'll turn it over to you now, Susan. Okay, great. Um, thanks for inviting me, Don, and uh, thanks to the Giuseppe Center for hosting. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. We'll have our first technology liftoff. Here we go. All right. So um, I have about 25 or 30 minutes of images and ideas that I wanted to share. Uh, so I'm, I just thought that for this, I would really jump into like broad strokes, what a lot of my work has been about, but focus more on the last uh, five years. So going back in time a little bit, but not, not way back. Um, and these are things that just keep arising for me and have been kind of constants. Uh, and then I'll spend some time talking about my last exhibition, If Water Had Its Way, too. So, um, and there should be time for questions. So. Um, I will try to, I have lots of images and I just kind of flip through them and chat as I go. Um, the big thing for me, I feel like that, that I've been working with uh, in abstraction for a long time is just uh, our relationship to landscape. M my practice exploring how our understanding to navigate our place in the world has shifted through the use of the mediated image. You know, uh, traditionally the horizon line may have acted as a stabilizing force and grounded our relationship to the planet. But now we're all uh, uh, comfortable and experienced with seeing the landscape from the view of an airplane window or maybe a satellite image. Um, even perhaps we've seen parts of our body that were once inaccessible on an MRI or in an X-ray. So we see further and smaller uh, beyond our senses. So we might not always know what we're looking at, but there's this um, familiarity with the aerial view that I'm really fascinated by. And I think even uh, built or illustrated environments have really shaped our understanding of the world. Um, these are some uh, photo illustrations from the New York Times. And I love the interplay of like, um, you know, direct imagery, but then there's these little graphic, almost futile lines that are trying to explain to us a uh, totally incomprehensible volume of ice that's falling into the ocean. You know, it's, uh, it always just strikes me as um, they look so delicate and fine and what's the calamity that's actually happening is so vast. Um, so with this context, I really consider myself a landscape painter exploring um, contemporary landscape painting. And I really feel like I gained a lot of clarity um, through an experience I've had with personal grief. Uh, years ago, my, my partner was diagnosed with ALS, a terminal illness. And I've been drawn to this inky blue black, the color of oceans and the cosmos. I feel like they're it's all about limitless space and the abyss. Um, but through this one experience of personal life loss, I really started equating it with, with death or at least moving beyond um, the realm that I can fathom, an existence I can fathom and into something beyond. This is one of my ch favorite childhood photos. Um, <laughs> it's my first documented reaction to mortality. There's my dad coming back from a duck hunt. And I remember he had a bunch of ducks like in just a brown grocery bag, um, animating the bird's carcass for my brother and me. And I feel, I still find death this surprising. And any of you that have experienced a big loss, um, my partner probably understand what I'm talking about, but my partner had two years knowing before he passed 
Um, we witnessed the slow failing of his muscles. We had time to think about where he was going and what my life might look like uh, when he was gone. But it was in the midst of this like really dramatic change on, that on so many le levels, we still couldn't really um, conceive of what it would bring. You know, you can think about it and imagine it, but until it's actually there, it's completely different. Um, in my studio practice though, this experience uh, drew me to creating what I considered caves or cracks. I wanted them to act like points of meditation, maybe passageways of some kind, a dramatic interior um, of negative space with uh, this blue black being the focal point, kind of nothingness inviting people in. And here's a, a studio shot of my process of trying to um, create these composite paintings of multiple panels. I really am drawn to the incongruities between one panel and, an, and the other. Uh, it reminds me of aerial mapping, maybe images taken at different times, different weather patterns and shifting conditions. Um, landscape so often is used as a relatable access point for describing spiritual concepts. You know, if you're in heaven, you're up in the clouds. If you're in hell, you know, you're somewhere down below us with rivers of lava flowing around it. This is um, an Anish Kapoor uh, piece called Descent into Limbo. And I, it was first created in 1992, but I admit I wasn't aware of this particular piece until 2018 when it got a lot of coverage because there was a tourist in Portugal that actually fell into the piece. Um, so for those of you, if you have any anxiety about, uh, or you seem to be on the religious fence of some kind, just rest assured that limbo is only eight feet deep apparently. Um, so <laughs> you might need some help getting out. You should probably travel with a friend and you'll have a good chance. Um, and then, so this all, while I was doing this um, body of work, I'm thinking about life transitions and the constancy of matter. Um, nearly all of the elements in the human body actually were made in a star. So they've, and many of them have come through several supernovas. And I just, I love those. The, if I have um, a belief system based on any sort of um, reincarnation, I kind of, that's like my, my take on it. So we're re literally reshuffled molecules. This piece, um, we're all cosmic dust. This is in, at, was at the Austin Gallery and at PSU, it actually doesn't exist anymore, that gallery space. And here are two of those cave cracks together. Um, they transition onto the floor uh, into a drawing with sign vinyl. So I'm just kind of extending the line into the space. This part of the installation to give you a sense of scale is about 20 feet wide and eight feet tall. And here's a detail of two of the panels that, that meet. Um, again, I'm drawn to these junctions because I really think it illustrates how we as humans are meaning makers. We like to connect the dots. We follow implied lines and um, we create cohesion out of confusion. Here's just some more details of the work, individual panels. So um, as I was making this work, I read uh, Rebecca Solnit's Hope in the Dark, Untold Histories and Wild Possibilities, which really is a lot about loss. She writes, to hope is to gamble. It is to bet on the future, on your desires, on the possibilities that an open heart and uncertainty is better than gloom and safety. To hope is dangerous, and yet it is the opposite of fear, for to live is to risk. After this exhibition and in countless conversations I was having with others, I realized that these themes, I felt like really had a parallel to how many were feeling about the climate crisis. There's this you know, endless march of wildfires, hurricanes, rising sea levels, and um, all of it is just as terrifying as the shutdown of my partner's nervous system. There's a sense of loss and fear 
um, there's grief and there's uh, simultaneously a struggle to step towards unknown possibilities, kind of reimagine an existence beyond. So this next part might be a, a stretch about landscape, but um, hang in there with me. For a while, I've been making these, what I thought of as kind of sci-fi forms um, that I put in my installations, which again, found their way into we are all cosmic dust. I wanted these pillars to seem like they were kind of bursting through the floor. I saw them as altars or maybe portals, um, a collapse in the space-time continuum, some sort of marker. Here is a um, painting by Hilma of Klimt, uh, a spiritualist painter from 1915. So I feel like there's, there's kind of a universal power to this, this form, this image. And here's uh, 2001 Space Odyssey. For those of you that don't remember, this big black monolith appeared and um, seemingly a transportation system from a supremely intelligent alien species. So as I was working, um, I was making these out, of, uh, these out of gallery pedestals wrapped in exhibition vinyl with just some watercolor and acetate on the top. Um, and I love taking a lo-fi approach to what is often kind of a, a, hook, a, a, a high production value uh, piece of like the minimalist, this is a John McCracken sculpture. But uh, the truth is I made this connection too in the end because uh, I received my Doug's ashes in this box, which was um, explained to me in the cremation contract as a sturdy plastic container. That's a quote. Um, and I instantly knew someone was playing a joke on me from beyond, like this is the ultimate portal, um, the ultimate transportation monolith. <laughs> So my point with all of this is that just as this Thomas Cole painting uh, is a reflection of the ideology of manifest destiny, here we are today, we're at the end game of colonization. We're figuring out some sort of exit plan. Do you all remember this? Um, when these monoliths started appearing around the world, this was uh, in the summer of 2020, the first one appeared in the Utah desert and they were totally mysterious. Nobody knew where they were coming from. Um, there was, it was maybe a 24, 48 hour news cycle kind of meme on the internet. Um, so we realized that the universe doesn't and nature doesn't revolve on us. And we're curious as to see uh, how this is all gonna end. Perhaps it's going to end by aliens or force. Um, maybe we're gonna construct ourselves a bridge to the other wor another world, which this might represent to people. Will technology save us is a constant part of the conversation. I feel like the frenzy that this um, monolith created in the Utah desert is a, reflective of a frenzy of people that are hoping there's an alternate reality to the one that's becoming painfully apparent. Um, this is not my photo. I believe it's from NASA. <laughs> uh, the over, it is here to remind me of, to mention a concept I really love uh, called the overview effect. It's a phrase that was coined by Frank White who wrote a book of the same name. And now that there's actually a documentary um, but apparently a large number of astronauts on their first mission look back on the earth and are so struck by the fragility and the paper thin atmosphere with our planet hanging the balance of the vastness of space that they're really overwhelmed by um, an obvious and imperative need to protect it. So this aerial shift, this shift in perspective, an aesthetic experience becomes a profound and life-changing environmental awakening. So I was um, reading The Bark Skins by Annie Prue, and toward the end of the novel, a character speaks of trying to ascertain what an ecosystem had looked like centuries after clear cutting had totally destroyed it. And she explained it was like when you pry a sunken stone from the ground, the shape of the stone is still there in the hollow. 
absent presence. Those words and the image that they created really stuck with me. Um, the concept of discovery through emptiness, knowledge through loss. And so the resulting is um, my show at Carnation in 2018, this is in Portland. Um, with those works, I really wanted to explore the edge, uh, shift in perspective, in positive and negative space that makes um, something move from being a shoreline to a deep black hole. Um, and I really wanted to exploit the transparency effect between the watercolor and this matte blue black. Um, paint, paint can capture such a wild and spontaneous beauty. I really liken it to this cataloging process of, um, that emerges when we're coping with loss, where we start to add up all the little things that we miss and even the mundane starts to seem supernatural in some way. At some point while I was working this negative space um, actually flipped around from the interior to the exterior. Um, and when it did that switch, I realized that all of a sudden it became a land mass or some sort of organism. Um, this one I named Pulse for that reason. And it's seven feet high by eight feet wide. Here are some details. So a tipping point alludes to an edge. And I think that we're both on the physical edge where we obviously cannot recover um, environmentally. And I hope on a cultural edge that leads to significant um, shift in consciousness and change. So my question with this piece was, is it sinking into the ground or rather gathering itself up from below and going to regenerate itself up onto the wall? The contemporary landscape is destabilized and we're experiencing this sense of groundlessness. I've installed this piece um, three times and I really have enjoyed changing the, the elements on the floor, the sand each time. So in, remember 2019, I guess, uh, I went to a science conference at Southern Oregon University and the keynote speaker there was actually um, part of the Klamath River Reclamation Project. This is one of the Klamath River dams. There's four dams on the Klamath River in Southern Oregon and Northern California and they're being de decommissioned. It's um, part of the largest river restoration project in history in the world. So it's Super controversial, obviously, and very exciting too. Um, I started playing around with these singular paintings, just trying to work out a visual vocabulary. This piece is called a Reservoir and it's five feet tall by three feet wide. Um, I wanted to play with this idea of segmentation, but I wanted the segments to actually feel kind of small, almost inconsequential. Um, maybe uh, almost like when you find a piece of metal in the desert that's been there for so long that it's uh, so deteriorated, it's kind of lost its own um, ability to really assert itself, but it's become embedded and looks like it's part of the landscape itself. So that was leveling um, the same size. So I'm thinking about all this and thinking about the importance of course of water and its many functions. Um, sustaining life, uh, literally changing the face of the planet. And um, I was wanting to create a multiple panel installation. Been looking a lot at how, again, exploring how humans kind of depict nature and how we try to um, understand it, use that information to navigate our, our, the world around us. So I found all these really wonderful and bizarre old um, comparative maps of glaciers and rivers. These are from uh, the Atlas of Geographical Wonders. And then I found this meander map, which I didn't even, I, these are new to me, but um, I just recently learned about them. They show the historical bend of rivers and how it changes over time. Um, and I love just the idea, it's such an analog, 
thing and it's capturing um, you know overlays of time in the same drawing. So I think that's really dynamic and exciting. So here's a, a studio shot as I was working on those pieces. So um, physical images and mental space. I, um, I caught this image at a natural history museum somewhere and I'm sorry it's so poor and I don't attribute it because I, I didn't ever think I'd show it, but it kind of gained importance um, and I couldn't find another example. Uh, it's just a composite image of another planet, the face of another planet, but um, the edge shows the limitations of the tool that, that we were using to um, capture that um, space. So it's all put together from smaller moments. And that kind of took an outsized importance as I started working on this piece and putting it together. I'm really into the idea that the work itself feels as if it's growing or assembling itself from smaller pieces. So is it, is it pixels? Is it kind of that composite image? Or is it actually generating itself somehow and growing into something bigger? And this whole process as I was working really was reminding me of Tetris, which was one of um, my favorite video games as a child of the 70s when we barely had our little Atari was you know, playing Pong and then moved on. Tetris was pretty, pretty great by then. Um, but uh, putting this puzzle together, you know, creating a bigger thing out of smaller parts. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Tetris, it's highly addictive. Um, and I ran into this Radio Lab episode. It's a podcast I listen to a lot. It was talking about learning and dreams and neural pathways and um, researchers actually using the game of Tetris uh, and this other video game, Alpine Racer, which is a, a, like a backcountry ski game where you have to ski through the trees. Um, they'd have people play this game for hours and hours during the day and then they put them, they um, go to sleep. And as they're falling asleep, they'd wake them back up and find out what they were dreaming about and like, a crazy amount, like 60, 70% of people were actually dreaming about playing these games. So um, I, it reminded me because I recently in the last five years have learned how to backcountry ski and uh, learning how to ski through the trees was um, terrifying for me. <laughs> and I would have these uh, reoccurring dreams about backcountry skiing and skiing through trees. And I interpret it always as this heightened anxiety um, that I must be anxious and trying to work it out. But what these um, researchers, dream researchers were figuring out is that um, if we perform a task, if you spend enough time on an intense activity, um, like even practicing a difficult score of music over and over again on the guitar, right? Um, you fall asleep and dream about it and you wake up and you're able to play it. I mean, a lot of you have probably had some sort of experience like that. Um, so really, as, you're, as your conscious self is sleeping, uh, your unconscious mind is still practicing the activity for you and learning. So now as I'm, as I'm working with these blue black squares, um, and this is me in prep time, like before the, before the exhibition, um, I'm thinking about them functioning as uh, in, in an active sense, mirroring emergence, you know, one small action becoming a larger thing, um, building over and over, fitting the pieces together um, to better understand, but also like a learning process for myself and for humans in general, like the active um, imagining of, of doing an activity over and over again, just like trying to grasp something, which is hugely, I guess, I just realized that it's very important to the metaphor of what I feel like a function of an art practice is too. It's like we do this thing over and over and over again in search of understanding. Um, so as uh, the, that's kind of where the little panels came from. And while I was researching all this, uh, I was reading an Anthony Doerr book uh, about grace. If you don't know his work, he's an he's a author in Boise, really great. Um, and I swiped the title for this show from one 
uh, passage of his work. He wrote, um, if water had its way, if geology stopped, the seas would chew up the continents and rain would wear down the mountains. Water would eventually scour the entire planet into a smooth definitionless sphere. We'd be left with a single ocean waist deep all over the globe. Then with nothing left to throw itself at, all the divisions and obstacles eroded, no unworn pebbles, no beaches to crash onto, every water molecule touching another, water would disclose finally what was in its molecular heart. Would it stand calm and unruffled or would it turn on itself? Would it throw on itself up into storms? So I was interested in this thought experiment. What if water has a sense of agency and you know, after everything has been left undone, um, what uh, will be left with our urge to undo? Now I'm gonna stop sharing this screen and, oh, there we go. I think I can just hit new share. I have a video of this piece that I had a photographer put together for me. Um, so. <clears throat> Do you see it right now? Yes, I can see the still. Oh, okay, great. Um, my Zoom window is on to me. I just lost it. I'm going to take this off. Let's see. Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of talk through this a little bit. Um, but as the door for the gallery opens, I had one of those dam paintings right at the beginning. And I, I wanted it to have kind of a, a little humble but magical beginning. <laughs> I imagined most viewers would come through the gallery and kind of read the piece left to right because that's how they're funneled in as they walk in. And I, I really didn't know how all of these, um, the river segments would fit together. I had some of the bigger elements of the work um, planned out in my studio beforehand, but to be honest, I was kind of overwhelmed by how it would look in the space and um, I'm glad I waited because I, I feel like you, everything, ch you know, it changes every time I put it up. Um, what makes one sense in one space doesn't make sense in another. And there's parts that I wanted to feel a little overwhelming, like especially this section in the back is kind of, it's pretty chaotic. And there's certainly an aesthetic of beauty, but I wanted it to feel like the wheels were kind of coming off and maybe it was a little too much. It's transitioning to sand on the floor there. There's some soft sculptures on the floor too, um, kind of breaking up and I feel like stabilizing the middle of the room a bit. I wanted them to feel like discarded, almost like rubble of, um, again, back to the dam. But I also liked, I've always liked soft sculpture because they're, they're kind of futile. <laughs> you know, they're not doing much. They're not super aggressive. Um, and I, yeah, I wanted it to feel as if um, they were a little flaccid and soft, almost kind of funny. Uh, Heather Tomlinson, she's of EOU's a theater department. She gave me the fabric and I loved that they were actually from um, the offcuts from monk robes from some musical that featured monks. So I thought that was very symbolic of the end days for colonialism. And the paintings do, you know, come down and extend onto the floor and then um, 
are integrated with the sand painting too. So um, sometimes I really enjoyed seeing viewers trying to figure out what's what, you know, there's something about um, the substance or materiality that's there um, that was a little bit, gets a little mysterious and confusing as people stand in front of it. Here I, you know, this is one of those moments where I was just realizing how all those different tonalities of blue blacks could really be exploited and maybe could be a bigger aspect of a future work for sure. I feel like there's a lot of possibility there. And this is just um, Mario stepping kind of out of the gallery space for a wide view. Huh. So, me. And I love uh, this is a, a photo of uh, me and my mom when I was a kid in a lake. <laughs> and it was just that little ripple effect. I just found this recently around Mother's Day or something. I posted it, but. Um, that is that little beginning, you know, um, ripple that I, I did in the sand, uh, one thing that I was thinking there. And I've, uh, I since was able to install this piece at Clem Gallery in Michigan. And um, it was, it's always really interesting how there's a lot of technical things that happen that um, stuff needs to be changed. The ceiling was lower in this space. So I had to make different, um, ways for things to connect. You can see how the starting point, I made that a little bit more active and larger. Um, other little moments that showed up, you know, so I, I like to play on site and, and figure out, um, you know, just activate it in different ways, play around with different compositions. And it was a much wider space. So I, I continued the river around for, longer. Um, and that brings me to just, let me see. Um, this is a quote, I'm not going to go ahead and read this. Um, but I am reading a book right now, um, Underland, A Deep Time Journey, that is just wonderful. And um, this is even, I think, from one of the introduction, it's like from <laughs> maybe the first uh, chapter or two. And I'm thinking a lot about um, things that we bury and kind of the planet as body, um, things that are hidden and revealed. Um, and yeah, anyway, that's kind of where I'm at in the studio is. Um, considering the entire, um, the entire planet more as an organism in and of itself. And there, I have some, um, some of the books that I referenced and stuff. I think I forgot to put an image of Radio Lab up there, but if you, if you like, if you're kind of like a science super fan, you'll love Radio Lab. So check that, check that podcast out. Um, and I think that is it. I hope I didn't go over. Are we okay, time-wise? Yeah, no, you didn't go over at all. Uh, we have some time for Q&A. If there's anybody in the audience that has a question, uh, you can just unmute oh, your, can... yeah. There. Uh, um, I, I have a question. Sure. Um, and that is, I... Your I, I'm intrigued by your transitions in in your artwork, where you're, you know, when when I think of transitions, I often think of something that one blends into another thing. <clears throat> but your transitions seem to be just sort of very abrupt in terms of, of the color presentations and the 
uh, sometimes changes in textures. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, <clears throat> I've been struck by how much continuity we find even when things are super different. Like, so I, I guess, I mean, on a visual sense, I'm really using value. It's the super dark value of the blue black and then whatever color inside. <laughs> and as long as, as long as they kind of match up, it's amazing how the eye might, you know, reads it as one form. Um, so I like pushing the edges of that um, in, in a major way, just because I feel like it's symbolic of that um, different time and place, different viewpoints. I mean, I'm blown away. I'm listening, of course, to um, probably too much news about what's happening in, in Russia and Ukraine right now. And, um, and one of the scariest things that I've been listening to is um, hearing of, you know, whole families not believing what's happening, you know, a Russian family not believing what a son in Ukraine is saying is happening because they're getting completely different news. Um, and of course, Russia, you know, Putin's using the same, uh, that's fake news BS that, that our, um, that Trump, you know, used coined right. that phrase that he coined and used way too often. Um, but you see it so much. I'm, I'm feeling like um, it's amazing how different our experience is of events from a different lens. Um, mm -hmm. Even if we're looking at, at real, you know, at, at real events. Um, so yeah, I guess that's one thing, like I said, that we're meaning makers and we kind of bring things together. Um, I also like the idea that it, it makes the viewer a, um, a real active participant in creating the artwork mm -hmm. because I didn't really make it all one whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, someone is deciding that it's an entire continuum mm -hmm. um, or maybe someone decides, wait, a big change happened there. So I'm in, I love um, thinking about how a viewer might fill in the blanks for me or you know become part of that piece like a more active part participant of the piece which i think is why i'm really drawn to installations too is it becomes a time-based um activity where you can't see the whole thing and just kind of soak it you know figure out what you think about it and and make a conclusion you have to experience it physically and walk through the space and spin around and stuff Right. And, you know, in transitions, you know, now that I, I think more about them and judging and take what you're saying into, into context, mm -hmm. you know, transitions are, are the smoothness of them are really a matter of scale of time and, and distance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're looking at the, you know, Cretaceous extinction of dinosaurs, for example, you can see that as an abrupt line, but you can also, but that abrupt line, if you were there at that time, would have taken years or months. So, but to us, a far more distant time, it looks like it's instantaneous. So, I, yeah, you know, I, I, you're, the way you've done those transitions, I think, is very provocative. So, thanks. thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's a little like, um, you know, I suffered from anemia apparently for years. I couldn't walk up the stairs without losing my breath. Mm -hmm. And I finally went to the doctor <laughs> and she said, Susan, you know, you're only in your forties. There's no reason for you to not to be able to walk up the stairs. And it's, but my body had changed so slowly. I didn't even really realize it became the new normal to where it wasn't an emergency situation, you know? And now that I look back, now that that's fixed, you know, and I look back on it, it's like, wow, it's amazing what we'll live with when thing, it's like being lobsters in the pot and the, and the water just starts to boil. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Ellen. Unmute your mic, Anne. Oh, okay, I just didn't know if you were calling on me. Um, Susan, your artwork is just fascinating. Could you talk a little bit about what medium you use? You mentioned sand a couple of times using paint and sand. How do you do yeah. that? Yeah, sure. So um, 
I usually start my marks by, um, I have this really large paper, you know, it's like six or five feet wide and 30 feet long. And I do these watercolor pours. Um, I've, I mean, in, in everything that I've shown you, I mean, here, here's a little scrap in my studio on my table here. So that's literally just, um, th this is UPO, so it's a polymer paper. So I'm pouring watercolor and it's just settling over time. And I love that, you know, it's a natural process. We're talking gravity and evaporation because of course um, pigment is just little grains of, of stuff, right? And it's settling or it's, or it's more chemical and it kind of stains. So um, I feel like I'm a kid playing in a mud puddle and just watching it <laughs> settle over time. Um, and it makes these nice little striations and everything. Anyway, I bring that up because if I actually painted all that with a little brush, I would need a brush made out of fairy eyelashes or something. And um, it would take me a million years too. And <laughs> I probably wouldn't have gotten very far. So I do these big watercolor pours on paper and then I kind of figure out how I'm gonna fit it, whatever kind of shape I want to make um, and cut it up into different pieces. Uh, and then painting the edges, you know, painting the negative space or whatever I want to be that blue black. I have a piece started in the back here um, that's going to connect to other things. Um, and then I, I play around with acrylic too um, and mix that in uh, to, to things. I like, I like that it um, goes from being super transparent and translucent with the watercolor to this viscosity, this thickness of the acrylic paint. Um, and then too, when it, a lot of times um, I'm bringing those panels onto the floor and then I'm using colored sand, which um, I'm looking at dyeing my own colored sand, but for, for now I've been buying some from um, like wedding, for wedding planners and stuff. Um, my my supplier must think I'm just this crazy wedding planner in Oregon that does all because I just buy hundreds of dollars worth of colored sand. But I think that's where that's what the market is for is usually, you know, votive candles and little things in in the front of tables and stuff. But um, it's really funny I, if you um, I don't know if if you have access to Instagram, I actually put a little video in my um, my Instagram where uh, I showed how I'm painting with the sand. Um, and what I've realized with sand painting is, I mean, every medium has this learning curve. It's amazing. And when I first used it, maybe in um, 2006 or so, uh, it's really garish. And I didn't even mix my colors. I just took whatever colors they gave me. But now I'm like glazing and doing scraffito, you know, drawing back into the sand and then pouring from high up and it disperses or blowing on it. And um, I really geek out on how to make a new mark. But this video on Instagram, I realized I wanted to mirror some round areas that were in the watercolor panel that was next to it. And I'm putting my elbow in, <laughs> in the sand because it was the right size. You know, I'm putting my elbow there and then I kind of did a glazing with another um, white sand on top. So it's funny. It's just too fun. I mean, if you're uh, a, are you a maker and do you make things? No. Yeah. Well, uh, any maker, I mean, you know, we get so excited. It doesn't matter if it's quilting or, you know, I get a chance to throw a pot in the ceramic studio or whatever, it's fun to just get your hands on other, other materials. Yeah, I said I was an appreciator. So oh, I appreciate your art. I don't make it. Thank you very much. You bet. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Are there any other questions in the audience? Maybe not. Uh, I had just, oh, DJ? Yeah. Um, I'm reminded of if Gabriel Garcia Marquez did cartography. It's like it's like maps gone magical realism. Because oh, cool. They're, okay. They're, yeah. They're almost maps. Those almost a north, and those almost a down, but those not. Um, is 
how do you play with that expectation in the viewer, particularly if the viewer is really used to looking at apps and science all this? Yeah. Well, it depends on the viewer. I'm either I frustrate them <laughs> or 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 it's fun. It kind of depends on people's vantage point. But um, I do think I mean, that is something that I'm really interested in is that a um, little bit going back to like the, the illustrations uh, in The New York Times, you know, there's a certain scientific illustration or even when people see bar graphs and stuff. Um, Sometimes we we give off um, well. There's a there's a trust that we pass over to to a community that's like, oh, this is quantitative quantitative information. It must be correct or something. So um, I'm I I really like um, exploring where we get it wrong too. Um, it's almost like some of those those quantitative. Uh, maps that I was showing where it has rivers lined up right next to each other so you can get a sense so you can understand the river in one in length and width a little bit better but of course in terms of how they're placed on the on the globe on the planet it's completely uh, wrong so um, I like those little incongruities um, there's a I'm gonna um, there's there's a concept called and I'm gonna I'm gonna mess this up. It's Latin. It's um, v plastica, um, and apparently back in the day, like Aristotle, people actually thought that that a lot of fossils were little bit of light. It was like the planet had a life force, and they were trying to create life, but didn't quite make it right. You know, they would see something like a whale. Um, you know, part of a whale carcass in a place that was desert and had no, had no um, creatures, maritime creatures at all. And they would assume that that was the head of a horse trying to be made, you know, when really it was a completely different, it was a fossilized anatomy of a, of a different creature. Um, so I think those little mishaps are super interesting too, because the truth is we, we do get it wrong as we stumble around trying to make sense of the planet that we're on. Um, and yeah, I, I think those moments are really great, but I like the, the magical realism. Thanks, I might use that. <laughs> Anyone else? So uh, did I miss something right at the beginning? What, where, do you have art up now anywhere? that we can see? No, um, not now. I was- uh, Or upcoming? Well, the next show that's in the area would probably be the faculty show at Eastern Oregon University. That'll be maybe in the fall or winter of, of this next year. Okay. Yeah. But I don't, I don't have anything hanging right now. I did at the Josephi Center, I had a couple pieces in the show that I juried. Mm-hmm. Rich, will you have Susan's video on our website so that other people can watch it? Because I'd like to send it to some artists. Yeah, uh, you're recording, right, Don? Yeah, I'm recording, and then we'll post it to our YouTube site, and I can share a link, too. Good. Thank um, you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Hey. Well, thank you. Um, Thank you. I just had a quick, uh, it's more of a comment than a question, but sure. I really appreciate the practical way that you're talking about your art process from reading books and listening to podcasts and looking at other images and just how you really described how you put those things together to influence your art making. I thought Thank that was really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and I did, I wondered, you were talking about the, the cubes or like the monoliths and the, yeah. um, how often those show up throughout history. And I was just wondering if you had mm. any other research or found anything interesting about why we're so drawn to that shape, because also like most paintings are in that square format. Um, 
Is there anything else interesting that you could speak to about that? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, when I think of painting and the rectangle or the square of painting, I, I think more of it, the history of it being a window into some other reality, you know, so that that, that structure of the window kind of frame was, I mean, we hung it on the wall and it was a window into a different, a different reality or something, but I, I don't know why, um, why the monolith really, but it sure has stuck around. I mean, it's kind of, it's very Western architectural um, structure, I suppose, but no, I, I have no idea. I'll look into it. <laughs> but do you remember, Don, when that, um, that those monoliths that were made, the sculptural ones showed up in Utah? Did you see that, Anna? I Ellen? don't remember that, but I do, I kind of want to go back and look into yeah. it because I thought that was pretty interesting. Did they ever, did anybody ever claim them or anything or are they still anonymous? I, I think they're they're kind of an anonymous. There was one I think in Central America that showed up that they found out a certain fabrication lab had kind of made it as a response to the one that showed up in Utah. But I don't know that anyone um, actually um, claimed the the piece in Utah. Do you remember, Ellen? No, I, I, I think they never identify that. And it was in a, it was a really remote place. I mean, it wasn't like yeah. it just up next to the highway. You had to go a long ways into, I think it was the um, uh, Grand Staircase Escalante. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was very exciting when it showed up. Long, long ways out there. That was a lot, that was a big commitment for an artist. Not to leave a trace of yourself, that was, Pretty amazing. Maybe it was able to <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Susan. This was really interesting and informative, and I feel like we're lucky to have you. Oh, thanks, Don. Thanks for inviting me, and I'm happy to happy to do things with the Giuseppe Center in the in the future. So keep me on your list. We will. Thank you. All right. Bye, everyone. Okay. Thanks a lot. We'll see you. Bye.